Okay, I'm waiting for it to become, here we go. So hello everyone, my name is Anna and I'm the Homeless Voices for Justice team leader. Homeless Voices for Justice is a grassroots organization organized by people who are or have experienced homelessness. We seek to empower people experiencing homelessness and poverty whose perspectives are often excluded from the development of policies and politics through protest, education, positive policy change, and reform. As a part of our annual You Don't Need a Home to Vote campaign, we are interviewing candidates running for local, state, and federal offices on the issues that are important to us and our community. Today, we're talking with Ken Capron, who is running for Portland City Council District 5. Close. Oh, it's did I do it wrong? It's capron. Apron. An apron with a C on the front. I'm sorry. I knew that I was butchering it as I said it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Let the I record good sense show. Of humor, though. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. So Ben has the first question. Yeah, it's, um, could you please introduce yourself to the voters and tell us why you decided to run for city council? Oh, uh, Ken Capron. I, I live on, uh, on Outer Forest Avenue at Princeton Pines and uh, I've lived in Portland since 1995. Grew up in the greater Portland area for the uh, past 70 years. So uh, this is where I, this is my home. Um, the reason I got involved, uh, actually there have been several things pulling me into this. Uh, I have run in the past and uh, in a very heavily liberal uh, uh, community, it's hard to, 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 for anyone who's fiscally conservative to, to get a foothold. I think this year there may be a chance for that. Um, but I look around and, and I've heard about a lot of these issues, the, the homelessness issue, the transportation issues, and, and on and on. And I've gradually gotten more and more involved in each one uh, over the past uh, uh, four, four to 12 years. And the question I always come back to when it comes to to getting involved is is why isn't homelessness solved already? Why are we still wrestling with transportation issues? Why are we still dealing with with equality issues and, and uh, uh, equity issues? So I don't understand why why we haven't solved these problems yet. And with my expertise in systems analysis. I'm hoping I can make a little bit of an impact on, on um, changing the status quo. And that's what I want to do. Primarily, my reason for getting in is to change away from the status quo. We can't keep throwing the same answers out there and getting the same results. We need, we need results that work. Thank you. If you, if you find that exciting, you're welcome to run. <laughs> so, Portland is currently experiencing an unsheltered homelessness crisis. There are many reasons why people don't use city shelters, including criminal trespass orders or restrictions, feeling unsafe at the shelter, feeling disrespected by shelter staff, and more. The city has failed to adequately address these reasons why people choose to or are forced to sleep out. What will you do to address unsheltered homelessness in Portland? Well, I think the fact that there are unsheltered homeless folks who have been rejected by the city shelter is just a clear indicator that the system they're using has failed. So first, if you're going to fix a problem, you've got to first acknowledge that what you're doing isn't working. And then you've got to, to put together all the ideas on the table that, that would have some ability to resolve these. and. The, the only thing I've come up with recently in trying to figure out what to do instead of a, a centralized homeless shelter out in the middle of nowhere would be to, to sort homeless people by their needs as opposed to their uh, inabilities. So, sort by, by their needs. If, if you need just housing, that's different if you need housing, mental health care, and, and drug abuse treatment. If you need a job, that's that's you know, probably not associated with the drinking and, and drug abuse. If you if you have the mental health issues, you need a whole different paradigm of care than if you're 
if you're just looking for a, a job because you lost one and you lost your apartment. So I think there's a real strong need to sort folks out by by their needs and house them separately uh, with multiple shelters. <clears throat> because let's face it, if you just lost your apartment and your job, you probably don't need a lot of services. In fact, you may be even able to help with the volunteer at the shelter, but you certainly don't want to be sleeping at night with people right next to people with the mental health issues. I think the city's city run shelter, if there if there needs to be one, should be the place where all the all the worst case scenarios uh, are are cared for and properly cared for. Um, with health issues, you know, uh, sort of uh, somebody look after uh, making sure people are taking prescriptions and getting the proper treatments, seeing their social worker and and, and stuff like that. Did I answer Carolyn. that? Question? Yeah, Carolyn, you have the next question. Pretty well touched on it <laughs> in that answer. So uh, it, this may sound superfluous, but I'm going to ask it anyway in case there's something you want to add. Um, smaller site shelters. While Portland is moving forward with the new concentrated homeless shelter and services center in Riverton, smaller site shelters are national best practice. Further, COVID-19 has shown us that large congregate settings are impractical and dangerous. Do you believe that Portland should move ahead with or move forward with the river location or that it should be considered changing course to a smaller shelter model? Well, it's interesting because uh, uh, I think it was the last uh, city council meeting during the public comment session. I, I, I asked if that was still if that plan was fixed in concrete or could could we take another look at the, the placement of a homeless shelter and and management of homelessness and you know, I, I'm when I first looked at this, uh, I was thinking very much about making finding ways to provide maximum services for the maximum number of people. But as you think about it over time, different people do have different needs. And so I, I think there should be a separate shelter based on, on needs. You know, we've got we've got some shelters that deal with drug abuse and that should be their focus and their specialty. And that's where people who need that kind of service should go. And if that particular nonprofit doesn't have the resources to expand to to take care of the extras, maybe we should be putting some money towards helping that nonprofit, uh, you know, do give it the tools it needs to succeed. Uh, the city doesn't have to do everything. So, so I am I, at this point, I'm I'm really against the Riverside project, um, and that's not just because I live in the Riverton area, but. I also think we need to reconsider and and uh, and look at smaller special purpose shelters. Um, I think we'll get better results out of that. Uh, and I was also I was asking some of the people in in my district uh, the other day what if we had a, a, a low needs shelter in the in the neighborhood would that be better than having a full fledged shelter in the neighborhood? And most people. We'd like to know more about that because, well, let's let's talk about the fact that most people don't understand the problem in the first place. We need to educate people. We need to show them that not all homeless people are are the stereotype that you see uh, on on uh, uh, Preble Street uh, at the middle of the day. We, we need to assure people that there are uh, many people who who are really great people. And I think I think of you folks, and I, you know I've known Jim Devine for for a long, long time. Um, and hey, I'd let Jim run my company if he was uh, if he was interested. <laughs> I don't see him raising the hand, so I'm out of luck. <laughs> but no, I, we got to do something different. And whether that's yurts and Deering Oaks or or specialized shelters, we've just got to try something different. And we just don't have to have the city be doing it. We can help uh, nonprofits uh, succeed at that mission also. Speaking of Jim Devine, he has the next question. Yeah, um, I well, 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 thank you for your comment, Ken. As a matter of fact, I did run a company called Devine Electric, which was electric contractor, which leads into my question. 
homeless voice for justice advocates have all experienced homelessness. And most of my life, I was electrical contractor, a mass electrician, and I was able to afford to house myself. Yeah. It was due to my due to my struggle with alcoholism that I became homeless. So, you know, I got a lot of help from places like Milestone and Alcoholics Anonymous and Preble Street. And one place in particular, I spent some time as a resident was Serenity House on Mellon Street, mm. which unfortunately closed due to lack of funding. So, and a lot of other service providers have had to restrict, re- reduce their services. So, uh, do you have any ideas on on how to make recovery services more available for people struggling with substance use disorder? Because that's of personal importance to me. Well, you know, I've had uh, some experiences. I used to be the accountant for the Northern New England Division of the Salvation Army, and they were always uh, proud of their efforts uh, to reemploy and, and train and, and help the, uh, the the homeless and uh, uh, the, the people with uh, different substance abuse issues. Uh, so I have a good sense of some of the things we need. I also was very involved in the uh, in the uh, 80s um, with the Little Brothers Emergency Shelter, which uh, took in uh, kids from eight to 18 for three weeks. They had three weeks, the kids did, to find a new home, to find a job, to find a school to return to. And I thought that was the most amazing experience. The point I'm trying to make is that we need to fund nonprofits, give them the tools that they need in order to do what has to be done. I mean, the last thing, uh, social social workers are, are given a set of tools to solve problems. And if you don't give them enough money and you don't give them enough uh, uh, support and space, they can't do that job. And, and so I think we got to start with making sure that people have the right resources for the problem at hand. And if that means uh, that in, in a uh, a, a specialty uh, shelter for people with substance abuse. You've got to have uh, substance abuse counselors. You've got to have somebody who's going to uh, look at the psychological problems that are that are causing it. Um, you know, I, I actually looked at people like Jim uh, as to how how the heck did you get out of out of that syndrome? I, I don't drink because I'm absolutely afraid that that I would get caught up in alcoholism. Because uh, I have kind of an addictive personality, um, so I think there's there's um, there there needs to be some very specific services and the tools that people need have to be funded, um, and I think there's ways to do that. Personally, I think the city is not being forthcoming with with the resources that are that that uh, should be made available. And, and homelessness isn't the only issue where that where you find that. I, I've argued to the council for for many years that the, not a single cent of CDBG money has gone towards helping seniors. Not one thing. And I tried very hard to get to get uh, what I call a memory cafe started, and and nothing. They don't even have a, a a senior center. So so we're missing the boat on a lot of things. I think we throw a lot of money out, out the window that could be going towards better services. Sorry if I ramble. <laughs> no, no, that's it's okay. okay. Can, I, can I, I, I ramble too. I could talk to you all day about my experiences. You mentioned oh, the Salvation no. Army. I spent two years at the Salvation Army on Preble Street, which is how I ended up getting involved with Homeless Voice for Justice in the first place, because it's right next door. Oh, cool. Yeah. Yeah, oh, that's so, awesome. So Ben has the next question. Yeah, um, when I was homeless, I already had a housing voucher, but due to the lack of affordable housing, I couldn't get my vouch- couldn't put my voucher to use. I spent five months homeless, which could have been avoided if there was more affordable housing. What will you do to expand affordable housing in our city, preserve affordable units, and prevent voucher discrimination? Um, well, I, I have actually been at the point in my life at one, one time of trying to decide which bridge I would like to live under. Um, and I say that humorously because I was literally on the edge of losing my apartment. And if my son hadn't come through at the very last minute, I, I would have uh, been caught in that cycle. And I, have, I, I tend to believe, knowing myself, I would have been caught in the cycle, 
not just for one night or a few nights. I think I probably would have ended up with, with this constant recycling. Um, I'm a real supporter of, of affordable housing, but my definition of affordable housing isn't $1,600 a month rent. Um, and I'm fortunate in that I, I do get some uh, rent support um, myself, so I know the value of it. And, and people live in fear of losing their rent support if they if they have it. Um, but I take a look at, at, and a good friend of mine uh, uh, mentioned this uh, strongly to me the other day. If you look at what they're doing with Washington Gardens, we're going to spend $14 million to renovate that when instead we could take an acre of land and build a five-story building for, for low-income housing so that people could afford a three or $400 a month uh, housing in a studio apartment. Now, my best example of affordable housing comes from working with the uh, uh, Volunteers of America, and I'm not sure if you're familiar with their, for, their facility up on the, uh, uh, on the Monjoy Hill, but they probably build one of the best facilities and they have a dozen around the state, uh, and I've visited many of them. They they not only have good facilities, they have rents that are as low as three hundred dollars a month. Um, and I I thought uh, that's how can you have such a nice facility at only three hundred dollars a month for for rent for for thirty I think they have thirty six people per building. And so I knew that if they did it, other people should be able to do it, whether that's a vest or or the city or, or whoever, if they can do it, why can't other people do it? So I actually, I, I actually worked with um, uh, VOA a, a couple of years ago on a, on a project in North Yarmouth, which would have been a, a um, an affordable housing situation in the center of town. And their definition of an affordable house was 275 to 295,000. And an affordable apartment and it was twelve hundred to fifteen hundred dollars a month. I, I'm sorry, I can't afford that. I I don't know where I'd live if I could. So so I'm going to fight because I think the the city's idea of affordable housing is is way too expensive, and I think we need to force them into uh, building a a second building at Washington Gardens or somewhere else to house a hundred people, rather than renovating, which can be done a unit by unit basis over time. And as I said in, in my pretty stern letter to the council, uh, and I always see, see John Jennings, but to, to Kate Snyder and, and stuff, you know, maybe people who are looking for affordable housing would be willing to lift a, a hammer and a nail and, and do some of their own rehab um, because that's, you know, they're just stuck wherever they are. Um, so I mean, that's that's a very brief and, and optimistic viewpoint, but I, I think you know, we just need to prioritize how the council is spending the money. Uh, and maybe they just don't know. Maybe they just don't care. I haven't figured out yet what uh, this this gentrification thing bothers me greatly because uh, um, it's the wrong direction. It's not what Portland. At least a lot of people in Portland don't think that's what it's about. But and I didn't know until I started to get involved a few years ago that th this is an obvious plan to move people out, uh, people less visually a a appealing people out of the center of the city so that the tourists don't have to deal with them instead of solving the problem. And, and that, you know, that that's not a new problem to this this country. Uh, and I'm assuming some cities have figured out how to solve that. And I want to find those cities and, and copy their ideas. Anyone like to travel? <laughs> <laughs> so both COVID-19 and police brutality have shown us that we need to focus on systemic racism in this country. Black, Indigenous, and people of color are, represent are overrepresented in both homelessness and poverty, especially here in Portland. What will you do to dismantle systemic racism within Portland social services? And how will you prioritize the needs of Black, Indigenous, and people of color residents? Well, until so, so the recent uh, protests by Black Lives Matter and, and, and the recent effort on the racial 
uh, issues uh, with the uh, ad hoc committee that the mayor has formed. I didn't realize there was as much uh, discrimination going on in the in the social uh, system as, as I'm hearing now. Um, and, and I'll be honest, with you, I'm I'm a, as strong an opponent to discrimination as you will find, whether it's racism or or any kind of uh, discrimination, religious discrimination. I I have a cognitive disability, so I'm a, a seriously alert to to um, what DHSS DHHS will do and not do. Um, and and I I. I'm willing to fight those cases, and I think it, maybe it would be a good idea for the city to to help fund people who are taking a case to uh, against uh, DHHS. Um, but I also have uh, a, I don't I mean I don't know a lot of people. I, I live in, in Princeton Pines, and we have at least 50 percent uh, of the residents are black, and and I've made some really good friends here. Uh, one one uh, in particular, Ben is a uh, it's a big model uh, railroad and ho uh, uh, hobbyists, and we share a lot of conversations. Um, so I, I, maybe I'm in a unique location because I, I don't see, I, I see us all getting along well here at, at the Pines, um, uh, and I don't live downtown, so I, I don't know if things are different. I don't have to deal with GA, so I don't know if that makes a difference, but I have, um, my sister married a, a black man from uh, Panama um, and had two girls. Um, he was abusive. She left him. <clears throat> she got cancer and her two girls went back to live with it, her, their dad. And then he, he, two years later, he died of cancer. So they were at 16 and 18. These two young black girls were on their own in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And if it weren't for the fact that they turned to the church, uh, down there, they would have been very much at risk, but they have managed, dis despite all those 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 challenges, they managed to recover. And one became a teacher, one became a social worker, and they've had kids of their own. They refused to get married. Um, so, so I know that the the fight is out there. I worry every day that somebody, some cops, going to pull them over and, and give them a hard time or do something. You hear about some real atrocities. Um, as far as police brutality, I, there is no room for margin in that. Uh, if we've got cops who, who are taking their anger out on, on individuals, no matter what color uh, or what the circumstances, um, we can't have that. Those cops need to go. I'm very f fond of the British and Australian system, and I'm not sure if you understand how that works, but most police in Britain and, and Australia don't carry guns. They carry the baton, but they have a separate group. It's not quite a SWAT, although they do have a SWAT, but they have a special small group of, of uh, police who are better trained, more able to handle situations and calm situations down, and they have the guns, and they have to be called in secondarily to any, any uh, major violence. So I, I think that's not a bad way to go, and, and it certainly has worked for, for Great Britain. And un unfortunately, I'm sure that some of our cops may get injured, but you know, in Britain, uh, these guys who don't have guns, they wear, they wear protection all the time. Um, it's not an accessory they put on later. So I have some very strong feelings about that. I don't know how, how accept, um, receptive the council is to that kind of thinking. I'm hoping this is a time when we can do, make some change and, and I'd like to be part of that change. Jim, you have the next question. Yeah, yeah, um, Jim, for, for 20 years I've been working with almost with the justice, uh, trying to ensure that people uh, directly impacted by policy are, are, are on the table and have a decision-making process in that. Uh, in the past, we've had our homeless with justice state house days. We had three sit-downs with a bunch of homeless people with Governor Paula Page and, and and uh, sometimes when, when there's a homeless issue at the city council, we've had to negotiate with the uh, office shelter staff so a person could come to the city council and testify and get back and still have their bed available for them. So, so uh, 
what, what, what are your plans to have homeless people or people impacted by your policies more directly involved with your decision making process? Well, I, my whole approach to, to solving problems is to involve the people who are most affected. I mean, I, I'm not sure how how we got where we did on this uh, on the new shelter issue, but it seems like somebody wasn't listening to the grassroots to begin with. And um, between the 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 staff who had had their ideas and you folks that that had your ideas and Preble Street and uh, and Milestone, everybody had had some ideas and I don't sure any of those were listened to in the process of developing a plan. I mean, it certainly doesn't look that way from an outsider's point of view, but I think it's an, you got to be at the table from day one on, on any discussion about what's happening. I, I, I think that the fact that we don't still don't have any real good idea as to what's developing on the shelter right now uh, on the new shelter it speaks terrible about the process that Portland uses. Um, I'm, I'm a frontline person. When I, I used to be the director of finance at the bus company at the Metro, and I always stood out because most of administration was, was very focused on, oh, the drivers are lazy and they're this and they're that, and they're very negative about that frontline, those frontline workers. Well, they are the front image of, of your community. And if we provide you folks with the right tools and let you, you know, work through what, what do you need and what, how can we help, rather than trying to tell you what you need, um, I think we'll get better results. And um, I've always been a frontline worker person. Uh, when I was in that main med, I mean, the nurses are the ones on the front line. Good God, let them do the job, give them the right tools to do it. But they were stingy, and, and that was, that's just, <laughs> that's a personal opinion. <laughs> um, but, you know, so everywhere you go, you, you got to involve the people who are going to be impacted. And maybe you can't develop consensus around uh, where to put the shelter or how big it should be or whatever. But you can certainly make sure that those voices are heard, which is the objective of HVJ. You, you want to make sure you're heard. But you also want to make sure you're listened to. And I am at your beck and call um, because I love this issue. And I know, Jim, if you want me to be somewhere at a certain point in time or you want me to hear something, I will be on Zoom all the time. I plan on having at least a monthly, if not more frequent, uh, Zoom meeting with, with my constituency uh, or anybody who wants to talk about politics. I just, if you aren't listening, it doesn't matter. I mean, you're not doing anything. Actions speak louder than words. Uh, so I would try to be a, very vocal. In other words, I'm going to piss off the rest of the council. Because <laughs> uh, I'll say things that they won't say. Um, I, I, I'm, I didn't get go to a uh, prim and proper school and, and learn all kinds of ways to not say what you want to say. Um, so anyway, that's that's just my opinion. Thank you. And Carolyn, you have the final question. You're on mute, Carolyn. Okay. Uh, if you are elected to the city council, uh, will you work to uh, and vote to uphold the city of Portland's longstanding 35 year commitment to provide emergency shelter to every person in our city who needs it? Yeah, I mean, what they're doing now is not, you know, denying people access to the shelter because they have some violation. That's not working. So, um, no, we've got to, we've got to, we've got to allocate the right sources to the right people. Period. You get the right. Once you have the right resources, if you know what the problem is, and I'm assuming somebody has sat down and defined what the problem is. The next step is to find out what resources you need to solve that problem, and then you come to a conclusion and say, "This is this is what we're going to do." And I don't see that happening. So, so I'm I'm going to be a, a thorn uh, in the side of of uh, uh, people who don't want to act and don't want to do the right thing, um, and it'll be accessible. Um, and I can ramble on forever. I just 
Hey, I'm there. I, I, I'd love to see y'all, you know, like I was going to put y'all on a, a luxury cruise ship and, uh, and, and give you job training and public health and all this other stuff. And, and I just kept being told, well, they'd all fall overboard and all that stuff. So there was, there was just, hey, you had a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I'd still do it tomorrow if if uh, if the right people were involved. Um, I would still do that. But so anyway, um, yeah. Uh, if I if I hear new ideas or new suggestions, uh, I'd be glad to bring it to the council. I I have no qualms about making mistakes or just saying stupid things or or embarrassing myself. I'm 70 years old. How can I get embarrassed? <laughs> <laughs> I only get embarrassed when my false teeth fall out. <laughs> <laughs> well, Ken, thank you for talking with us today. We're excited to share your answers with our community and to work to educate the voters of the city of Portland on who their city council candidates are. Thank you very much. I enjoyed the opportunity. Uh, I'm so glad to meet everybody. It's uh, that's a great cause. We'll get there. We'll get there. Thank you. Thank you.